In this video, I'll discuss one of my favorite symphonic movements by Mozart, the brilliant finale of his Linz Symphony, number 36 in C major, K425. I will also include a brief basic explanation of sonata form, one of the most important formal structures in classical music, originating from the binary form common in Baroque music. The finale begins with this classic Mozartian theme, As with many of Mozart's masterpieces, the Linz Symphony has an almost supernatural origin story. In 1783, Mozart and his wife stopped in the city of Linz while traveling from his native city of Salzburg to their home in Vienna. As the story goes, a nobleman from Linz heard of Mozart's arrival and invited him to give a concert. Since Mozart didn't have a symphony handy, he composed an entirely new one in only four days to meet the deadline and ever since it has been nicknamed the Linz Symphony. During my own trip to Austria last year, I made the same journey from Salzburg to Vienna, and like Mozart, I briefly stopped in the city of Linz. I only had a couple of hours, so instead of composing a symphony, I decided to use perhaps the only two hours I will ever spend in that city, making a pilgrimage to the famous house in which Mozart composed the symphony as you can see, proudly advertised on Google Maps. When I arrived at the location, I searched the entire neighborhood for at least some sort of commemorative plaque, but there was nothing. Disappointed and exhausted from the train ride and from dragging my luggage across so many treacherously uneven cobblestones, I decided as a last-ditch effort to ask the man at a nearby sausage stand if he knew anything about the Mozart house. His eyes immediately lit up, and he moved away a few giant vats of mustard and sauerkraut to reveal this tiny display that includes the Linz Symphony's origin story and that plays an excerpt from the symphony's first movement when you push the button. It also for some reason included this rather creepy death mask of Mozart. With my mission now accomplished, I happily bought a sausage from the man, sat down in the house's beautiful courtyard to eat it, and then I did the only fitting thing a person could have done in this exact situation. Before moving on, I'd like to share a quote from this book, that provides a more nuanced and probably more realistic explanation of the famous folklore surrounding this symphony. The Mozart couple arrived at Linz on Thursday the 30th of October, 1783, and were escorted at once to the Thun Palace. The following day, Mozart wrote Leopold, On Tuesday, November 4th, I shall give an academy in the theater here. And since I have no symphony with me, I am writing a new one at breakneck speed, which must be ready then. The five days allowed by this scheme, if we are to believe Mozart, were scarcely enough to copy and check the parts of a long and imposing piece for large orchestra, such as K425, let alone compose such an inventive and path-breaking work. Mozart may have exaggerated for effect, as he often did, and perhaps the time span was not so short, since the Mozarts spent an entire month in Linz. There is no other data confirming a concert on the 4th of November. If it did take place, then one can only conclude that the composer must have formed the grand design of the symphony in his head well before this time. Stepping away from the Linz symphony for a moment, here is my very basic summary of sonata form. A typical sonata form has three main sections, the exposition, the development, and the recapitulation. Some also begin with a separate introductory section, or end with a separate coda section, but the finale of the Linz Symphony doesn't have either of these. Like the exposition of a movie plot that introduces the main characters, 
the exposition of a sonata form introduces the main themes of the movement. The first theme is in the tonic key, and at some point in the exposition section, the music modulates to a new key, usually the dominant key in music of Mozart's era, and the exposition ends in this new key. Typically, a second, often contrasting theme appears just after this modulation, in the new key. Additional themes often appear both before and after this modulation, but whether to call something officially a theme or just a passage is subjective. If an additional theme occurs near the end of the exposition section, this is often called a closing theme. In one of my prior Haydn videos, I stated, and this is the first time I've ever quoted myself as an authority, Mozart rarely composed monothematic sonata forms favoring instead exposition sections with a rich diversity of thematic material. By contrast, Haydn's sonata forms are frequently monothematic, and the second themes are often only slightly altered transpositions of the opening themes. Of course this is a generalization for both composers, so let's see if it's true for this Mozart movement. The opening theme that we've already heard twice if you count my whistling, is followed by this forceful red figure, upon which nearly the entire development section is based, more on this later, answered by this bright green figure that returns even sooner near the end of the exposition section. Now listen again from the beginning of the movement up to this point. Next, we hear this orange transitional or modulatory passage that I'm calling the K333 passage because it's almost a quotation from his K333 piano sonata in B flat major. Interestingly, for most of its history, the K333 sonata was erroneously thought to have been composed a few years before the Linz Symphony, hence the much lower K number, but recent scholarship suggests it was actually composed during the same month in the same house, and recent recordings have even dubbed it the Linz Sonata. The function of this passage is to modulate to the dominant key of G major. This can be accomplished in various, sometimes circuitous ways, but in this movement the modulation is straightforward and typical, beginning with a secondary dominant 5 of 5 chord that hints at tonicizing the new key, with eventually this chord that tonicizes the secondary dominant itself, though at this point I think most people hear it as the primary dominant of the new key, which is the point of a successful modulation. However, if this modulation hasn't adequately convinced you that we're in G major by this point, Mozart hammers a couple more 5-1-5-1 chords, and finally a 5-7 chord, to introduce the new second theme in the now very firmly established new key of G major. Now listen to this modulation. <laughs> I'm calling this new yellow contrasting second theme the K595 theme, since it reminds me of the very similar dotted version of this theme that opens the second movement of his K595 B flat major piano concerto. <laughs> 
Of course, I also could have called this the Haydn's Military Symphony Second Movement theme. Or I could have called this theme the once thought to be Beethoven, but now thought to be spurious G major sonatina theme. Recall the famous Richard Atkinson quote from earlier about monothematic sonata forms, and then ask yourself if you recognize the sneaky camouflaged version of the opening first theme embedded in this second theme. I chose the finale of Mozart's Linz Symphony instead of a much simpler sonata form, like the first movement of his K545 piano sonata for beginners. Because of my belief that music pedagogy should focus on masterpieces, but also because the Linz finale is a fairly standard sonata form that also has some interesting deviations from the norm. Of course, even the K545 piano sonata isn't a completely cookie-cutter sonata form, since the recapitulatory material begins in the subdominant key instead of the tonic, a trick I previously described in my video on the fugal finale of his K387 string quartet that also does this. The first significantly atypical moment of the Linz Symphony finale occurs now when the second theme ends and we immediately launch into this magnificent double fugato, of course one of the main reasons I chose this movement. The simple blue subject eventually drops out, and the purple subject is now combined instead with this new material played by the violins and these suspensions played by the woodwinds. Finally, in one of my favorite parts of the movement, the violins take over playing the purple subject, suddenly in G minor, with the same suspensions in the woodwinds. This was one of the examples I excluded from my prior video about fleeting major minor mode shifts, because at the time I had already planned to discuss this whole movement separately. Now listen to this fugato section. After the brief excursion to the minor mode we just heard, we return to G major with a reappearance of this bright green passage from earlier in the exposition. Just as a reminder, this is what it sounded like previously. This bright green passage now becomes the subject of a very common maneuver in Mozart's orchestral music, in which there is three-part imitation with the second voice entering at the unison, while the first voice plays the same thing a third above, although in this case altered significantly, followed by the third voice entering an octave below, although in this case also at the unison doubled an octave below. We could call this the K415 first movement maneuver, since Mozart's K415 C major piano concerto begins with it, 
could also call it the K202 second movement maneuver, since it also begins the second movement of his symphony number no. 30, K202 in D major. Or if you prefer, we could call it the K385 fourth movement maneuver, since it also occurs in the finale of his Hofner Symphony, number 35, K385 in D major. Interestingly, in this case, like in the Linz Symphony finale, it's based on a motif from earlier in the movement. The Hofner Symphony finale is one of Mozart's most brilliantly humorous creations, and certainly deserves its own video when I finally get around to it. Returning to the Linz Symphony, we now hear another of my favorite moments, this rollicking pink scalar passage, leading to the closing theme of this exposition section. In this case, just the original first theme from the beginning of the movement, though now energized by the fortissimo dynamic markings, the tutti scoring, and these impatient syncopations from the second violins. Using the original first theme as the closing theme, is slightly atypical in Mozart and Haydn sonata forms that are not monothematic, but certainly much more common than inserting an extended fugato passage not based on any of the prior thematic material after the second theme. Now listen to the end of the exposition section, including these final falling arpeggios and 5-1 cadences. <laughs> I included the first few bars of the repeat just to point out that in Mozart's era, the exposition section of a sonata form is almost always repeated. Very often, the development and recapitulation sections are also repeated as a single unit, especially in early Mozart and Haydn pieces, in which the sonata forms are still closer to the Baroque binary form from which they evolved. The development section, as its name suggests, develops the thematic material introduced in the exposition section. To continue the movie plot analogy, this is when the characters begin to interact with each other in more complex ways, and when conflicts arise between them. In musical development sections, the tonality often visits various distant keys, frequently involving the minor mode if the overall movement is in major, and the themes are often combined more contrapuntally often imitatively cycling through the circle of fifths. The development of this movement is rather atypical, because the two main themes are nowhere to be found in the entire section. Instead, as I mentioned before, the development is almost completely based on this red figure from the exposition section. <laughs> The development section begins with a slight rhythmic variant of this figure. I'm calling this the Haydn String Quartet Opus 9 No. 1 in C Major 4th Movement figure, since this new variant is identical to the theme that begins this movement. <laughs> ¶¶ 
to Mozart, notice that after just two iterations of this figure, the tonality has already modulated and prepared us for this A minor forte entrance of the original rhythmic variant from the first violins. This is now subjected to the imitative cycling through the circle of fifths that I mentioned before, paired with this sort of backward and rhythmically shifted version of itself. Now, the new Haydn String Quartet Opus 9 No. 1 version of the figure alternates with the original version a few more times, now featuring solos from the bassoon and oboe. These entries bring us to this final portion of the development that functions as an extended G major chord, preparing for the original theme in C major to begin the recapitulation. Now listen to the entire development section. Development sections like this that ignore the main themes and instead develop a seemingly unimportant figure are atypical, as I mentioned before, but certainly not uncommon. For example, the development section of the first movement of Mozart's 33rd Symphony in B-flat, K319, is entirely based on this seemingly unimportant trilled figure from the exposition section, paired with this newly introduced four-note motif that he later famously used in the finale of his Jupiter Symphony. The recapitulation section, again like its name suggests, recapitulates or restates the material from the exposition section. In rudimentary sonata forms, like in many early works of Haydn and Mozart, the recapitulation section is often a nearly identical repetition of the exposition section, but with one important difference. It remains in the tonic instead of modulating to the dominant. In mature Haydn and Mozart sonata forms, the material is often significantly altered, with further developmental sections or shuffling of the order of certain passages. But even though the Linz Symphony Finale certainly qualifies as a mature masterpiece, its recapitulation section has only minor alterations. The first main difference is the one we expect to find in every sonata form. The orange K333 modulatory passage is modified so it no longer modulates, leading instead to the entry of the second theme in the tonic key of C major. As a teenager, I had the totally normal hobby of cataloging all my favorite differences between exposition sections and recapitulation sections in this notebook that I still have. I'm mainly sharing this as a warning to the inevitable viewer who tries to start a sonata off with me in the comments section. Before you do that, make sure you've read this book, and not just this one, and it might also be useful to listen to Haydn's complete recorded works, a simple task that only took me slightly under 30 years to accomplish. And by the way, if you actually decide to do this, just make sure you like the sound of the baritone, a strange instrument played by Haydn's patron, for which Haydn composed over a hundred trios. Now returning to the Linz Symphony Finale, notice the following additional minor changes Mozart makes to this recapitulation section. I won't list them all, just the most obvious. <laughs> 
First, the K415 maneuver is now doubled by the oboes. Then, the rollicking pink passage receives these slight tweaks. And finally, the closing theme and the impatient syncopations are played twice this time, trading places in the score the second time. This leads to the final bars that some might argue constitute a small coda section, since these eight bars are new material. But I would not go that far since the movement ends with the same falling arpeggios that end the exposition section, though the final notes have a slightly different rhythm. Now listen to the entire recapitulation section of one of my favorite movements from Mozart's symphonies, 